All right. Lecture 12. Hope everybody had a good weekend. Um, real quick, um, how did the block shear assignment go? Because I imagine that one might have been a little bit on the tricky side. So, because I was a little vague on like defining the path, but really the most likely path is this one. Okay. So the idea is that the section rips out like this. So you have four chunks, right? Now you could define a failure path that's sort of the inverse of that where it rips through the middle, but that's a lot more um, tensile area than just these, you know, four little bits here, here, and here. So that's the, um, that's the, the path and whatnot. So yeah, I was, I was purposefully kind of vague on that because um, I wanted to see what you came up with. So, so yeah. All right, I'm going to save that. Uh, say yes to all. No. Or you know what? I don't care. Don't say. Okay. All right. Um, so just a little bit on logistics. You have a homework due today. You have a homework that's assigned today and due Wednesday, and that is the only homework this week because we celebrate on Friday. Now, just so everybody's clear, uh, for homework 2.9, which I'm assigning today that is due Wednesday, I'm not accepting any late work because I'm turning the solution on right on Wednesday at 9 a.m., okay? Because I want you to have the solution uh, for studying for the exam on Friday, okay? Does that sound good? Okay. All right. So today we're going to um, uh, go through our very last topic in uh, tension members, which is threaded rod design. And I know I say this often. I say, oh, we'll get done early. I actually kind of think we will get done early because I've already done about half this lecture when we talked about the Hyatt Regency collapse. So I'm not going to go through the Hyatt Regency collapse in more detail or, than, than I did last time, other than to just say that um, the Hyatt Regency is, um, I mean, the reason that it's typically mentioned at this point in the class is because the failure uh, involved a threaded rod. It involved a rod in tension, and so it sort of is a natural place to, to bring up the, the topic. But today what we're going to do is discuss the design of threaded rods. So threaded rods are elements in tension that um, are really just that, just, just round bar where threads uh, have been cut into it uh, and whatnot. Um, a couple things, um, they're, they're, they're pretty common for uh, sag elements and for um, uh, some diagonal bracing elements in buildings because they're really lightweight and really efficient and they're pretty simple. Just take some round bar, cut some threads into it, boom, there you got a tension member. Um, the, the thing also about threaded rods is that unlike other tension members that have gross section yielding, net section fracture, block shear rupture, blah, blah, we only have one limit state and that's the tensile rupture uh, and what have you. Now in terms of commonly available bar diameters, so um, whenever you're doing a design problem, you're not going to call up Huntington Steel and say, I need a rod that is 0 0.73 inches in diameter. You're not going to do that. Instead, what you're going to do is round up and say, just give me three quarters. Okay? Threaded rods uh, are commonly available in eighth inch increments, anywhere between a quarter inch and a one and a quarter. Once you get past one and a quarter, they're commonly available in a quarter inch increments. Now I say commonly because if you start getting into like two, three inches, it might be kind of tough to find like a two and a quarter. You might need to go to two and a half. But I would also say that if you've got a threaded rod that's that big, you'd probably end up just going with a tension member because we're talking about some, some that's, a, that's a big rod. <laughs> um, so you'd probably end up just going with like an angle or a channel or, or something like that anyways. So um, I would say most common is probably, I mean like that I've seen, you know, maybe up to about an inch and a half, something like that. Um, I don't know that I've seen, like just personally, seen anything that much bigger, but I mean, you can get them, so. Um, okay, uh, so the relevant specifications for threaded rods are actually not gonna come out of chapter D. They're gonna come out of chapter J, okay? And we've already started to dip our toes a little bit into chapter J because we were talking about chapter J with block shear, okay? Um, Chapter J is going to monopolize our lives um, for the most part between now and the end uh, and when we get to spring break from here on out. Because chapter J is the chapter on connections. And so we're going to be talking about bolts and welds uh, in chapter J quite a bit. Um, now the expression to compute the capacity of a threaded part is pretty simple. It's just the, some nominal stress 
times the area. But that nominal stress, um, well, it depends. Uh, it depends on both the, um, the, the, the grade of the part that we're looking at. It also depends on whether or not the element is in shear or in tension. Okay? Um, and even if it's in shear, there are a couple of other delimiters as well. Um, now, one thing I will mention about the specifications, and this is just sort of true about specifications in general, the steel manual is no exception, is that sometimes navigating the spec can feel like a scavenger hunt. Because, for example, if you're in this section, this section is, okay, this is how you compute the capacity. Okay, well, how do I get this value? Well, you got to go to another section. you got to go to this section right here. And so sometimes you'll open uh, the spec and it'll say to get this value, go here. And then to get this value, go here. And, and that's just sort of the nature of specifications. Sometimes it can feel like a scavenger hunt. And that's true with steel, concrete, bridges, highway. It, it doesn't matter. That, just because of the nature of how to organize those documents. I mean, whenever you're writing a specification, you try and make it as broadly applicable as possible. And then you're an engineer trying to solve your problem. And then your problem requires you to jump to different sections of the spec. And that's just sort of the nature of the beast. Um, okay, so if you look at table J3.2, this is the table that lists the uh, tensile stress and the shear stress of threaded parts. Um, we're going to look at this table quite a bit um, after the first exam uh, because obviously we're going to need this for bolts. Um, one thing I will say is, um, uh, you know, when, when you go from manual to manual, so we are currently using the 16th edition. If you had any friends that took steel design last year, they were using the 15th edition. And the manual was sort of this like aquamarine blue color, and now it's gold. So whenever they come up with a new manual, they usually like to change the color. So it's pretty easy to see that you're using a new manual. But um, I usually tell students that when we jump from manual to manual, nothing changes really conceptually. I mean, steel design is steel design. The process is, is very, very much the same. But sometimes the details change. And one, thing, one detail that really did change from the last manual to this one is this, uh, related to bolts. So last year, the, bolt, uh, uh, the, the way that bolts' uh, uh, strengths were specified was way different than it is now. Last year, uh, last year, we just had like a group A and a group B and a group C. And now we have these like group 120s and whatnot. And we'll talk about when, when we get to bolts, we'll talk about why they're grouped like this. That'll, that'll make sense later. Um, but right now, we're not really interested in the, um, the individual fasteners because we're just looking at threaded rods. So we're just looking at, so if we look at this, we look at the different fasteners, then we have A307 bolts and then these various different groups. And then this bottom row is any, basically any other threaded part, which is really what we're looking at because we're looking at a big threaded rod. And we have three columns. We have a tensile stress, and then we have two different shear stress uh, columns. The difference between the two is whether or not you're shearing through the threads or not. And if you shear through the threads, the bolt or the threaded part is weaker, right? So you have a smaller value here than you do here, okay? But we're not, we don't really care whether it's being sheared because we're not talking about shear, we're talking about tension, okay? So if you take a threaded rod and apply tension, we say that its nominal tensile stress is 75% of FU, okay? So that 75% is just reducing it, reducing its effectiveness to account for the fact that you've got a threaded rod, okay? Um, and so just the only thing I'll say is we're going to come back to this table later. So, Okay, so if we say that the capacity, so I'll, I'll just, uh, everything that I've got here on the slide is what I'm going to write here on the board, but if we have the capacity is phi times some nominal stress times a bolt, or an area of a bolt, or an area of a bar, well, phi is 0 0.75, the nominal stress is 0 0.75 FU, and then the area, now we actually are talking about the area of the bar, so we're talking about pi over 4 times the bar diameter squared. Well, that's where we get this, okay? Now, what I'm doing here, because everything's, uh, uh, you know, sort of increments of 0.75, um, this is sort of my way of doing it where I say, well, instead of 0.75, let's just write three quarters. Let's just write a three quarters here and a three quarters here and a three quarters here. And I do that. There's a reason why, but um, just to uh, give you a, a spoiler alert, um, if you take these three fractions, three quarters, three quarters, and then this one quarter here, you get nine over 60 fourths. And nine over 60 fourths is a perfect square. And the reason why that's kind of cool is because we're going to take a square root of that here in a second. So 
I propose that you can actually write phi R n. So this, this in, you know, if we look right here, this is phi R n, phi R n, the, not, the factor of resistance. We can actually simplify this pretty easily. We can say it's 9 pi over 64 times the stress times the bar diameter squared. Okay, so if I have a threaded bar um, and I want to determine its capacity, the only thing I need is the bar diameter and then the ultimate tensile stress. That part's pretty easy. So the reason why this is pretty slick is because I only have one limit state. Here's my limit state. So how do I design? Well, I just solve for the bar diameter. That's all I got to do. Okay. So what I will do is say, okay, let's set this equal to the load. Just rearrange, solve for dB. That's it. Like that's pretty, it's pretty simple. So how do we determine or how do we design a threaded rod? Well, we determine our factored load, we compute a bar diameter, and we pick one. That's it. <laughs> that's, that's pretty much it. Um, so so the, uh, the math is, is pretty straightforward. Okay. And again, remember, we're going to go from uh, a quarter inch to one and a quarter. We're going to do that in eighth inch increments. That's, that's commonly what you can find. Okay. So what we're going to do today is we're going to do a threaded rod problem. Okay. So... What's our threaded rod problem going to be? It's going to be this. Oh, I forgot something. Well, but I, 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 I say I forgot it because we actually did kind of talk about this uh, in class last time. Is that do we have to consider slenderness? And the answer is no. Um, remember, we have growth section yielding, net section fracture, block shear rupture, and slenderness. Well, instead of those three strength limit states, we only consider the one associated with threaded rods. But then that, what about slenderness? We don't apply slenderness limits to threaded rods because they are inherently slender. So we don't have to worry about it. Um, so, again, pretty simple. Okay, so here's going to be our problem. It's like that CE3, 312 stuff just won't go away. We have ourselves a truss. we got to do some truss analysis. Okay, so we're going to select the most economical threaded rod of A36 steel for this structure right here. Okay, and so we're going to treat this like a truss. Okay, so this diagonal tension rod, this diagonal threaded rod is serving as a tension member to resist a dead load and a live load being applied right here, okay? We're going to assume that the left support is a hinge and we're going to, uh, or a pin. We're going to assume the right support is a roller and we're going to analyze this truss. Remember that whole method of joints and method of section stuff? Remember all that? So we're going to use that and we're going to solve uh, for the force inside this member. So this is going to be a little bit of a review from all that stuff from last semester. So let me, uh, let me close this. All right, let's go to this right here. Okay. Now, before we move into the, um, the actual problem itself, um, the first thing that I think we ought to do is just factor the loads. Let's just go ahead and do that now because I want to I wanna get that part out of the way. Okay? So we're given that... Um, so what are we given here? So we'll say factored load... So I'm, first off, this is 3,000 pounds. I'm just going to convert that to three kips. And this is seven kips. So therefore, PU is 1.2 P dead plus 1.6 P live, which is what? 14.8 kips. Do I have a second? Okay, I got some seconds. Okay, so um, the reason I wanted to go ahead and do this first is because I wanted to go ahead and get the design stuff out of the way, and I want to get back to brass tacks to what we did last semester. Now, I want to be, I want to ask a pointed question. Is 14.8 kips the amount of load in the tension rod? No, no, because that, the, the difference is that 14.8 kips is what we are applying to the structure, okay? What we need to know is how much force that threaded rod is carrying if we apply that to the structure. So we got to go back to what we did last semester. So, so what we're going to do is we're going to turn this into a CE312 structural analysis problem. Okay. So I've got a truss joint, truss joint. We've got a truss joint. 
truss joint, we have a member like this, 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 and we have this. Okay? Now, we said that we were going to treat that as a pin support. So there's our lovely little triangle. And this is a roller. So this is a lovely little circle right here. Okay? We are subjecting this to a... 14.8 kip load. So like this is, if we wanted to use mass hand, for example, this is what we would put into mass hand. Okay. So we've got this right here as 15 feet. We've got this right here as 20 feet. Okay. Now, the, uh, let's see, the only other thing I'll, I'll indicate before we start solving this thing is that this diagonal is at a three to four slope ratio, okay? All right, so let's do some applied physics. All right, so how many unknown reactions are at the roller? One, right? How many unknown reactions are at the hinge? Two, okay. So we have a horizontal reaction and a vertical reaction here. Can somebody here, let's... Let's put some letters on this. Let's let's uh, let's say that this is A, B, C, D. Can anybody tell me what is the horizontal reaction at A? There you go. Fourteen point eight to the left because the structure has to sit still. Right. The structure has to sit still. So if we have 14.8 to the right, we have to have 14.8 to the left, okay? So if I sum forces in the x direction, and I recognize that the sum of those forces must be equal to zero in, in order for the structure to be in equilibrium, then Ax has to be 14.8 kips acting to the left, okay? Now, are the vertical reactions zero? Well, there's no vertical forces, right? Somebody you're shaking your head no, right? That's right. They're not zero, okay? Because what's happening, here's what's happening, okay? Because this is, uh, you know, it's been a while since you all have done structural analysis, and I know it's very tempting to look at this and go, well, there's nothing going up and down, so the vertical is zero and the vertical is zero. That's not correct, okay? Because if I treat, sorry, if I treat the, um, the truss just sort of as a, a big old box like this, okay? I have a reaction here or a force here and a reaction here that is wanting to rotate the entire truss this way, right? The entire truss wants to rotate that way, right? That's what those forces are doing, okay? So what that means is that, you know, if here's the truss, I have a force here and a force here, it's gotta wanna rotate it that way, right? And the only way it can do that is if this reaction goes up and this reaction goes down, okay? Now I propose to you they are equal and opposite, right? So if this is, I don't know, 20 kips, this is also 20 kips, okay? But they have to be equal and opposite, okay? Equal and opposite such that they provide the same amount of rotation that the other one does, okay? And so how do we do that? Well, we assess that by summing moments. So we'll sum moments at a place where a lot of unknowns intersect. So I'm going to sum moments at A, okay? So we'll sum moments at A. Y'all know me. I like to draw myself a little table. And we'll say everything rotating this way goes on the left. Everything rotating this way goes on the right. So summing moments through A, do we consider AX? Do we consider AY? No. What about BY? Yes. Okay, so BY, does it belong on this side, the left side or the right side? What's that? Left side. left side. So, I think I drew that backwards. I think I did. But, oh well, it'll be all right. I did. I drew this backwards. That's what I did. See, I was like, something isn't right. This is rotating it like this. But this needs to rotate it like that. Yeah, I drew that backwards. Nobody called me out on it. But I caught it. Ah. 
I don't know. Again, though, I'm the one that, that um, I'm the one that, that tracks the mistake, so I know it's a corrupt system. Okay, let's try this again. All right. So by goes on this side, so we put by, and what's our moment arm right here? Twenty. Twenty. All right. Then, so we taking care of this, taking care of that, because they both go through. Taking care of this. What about fourteen point eight? Which side does it go? Left side or right side? Left side, and what's the moment arm? What's the shortest distance from the line of action of this force to A? Say it again. 15 feet. So, all right. Okay. So that means over here we've got BY 20 feet, and then over here, 14.8 times 15. I'm not that good. What's 14.8 times 15? 222. So therefore, BY equals, so if I divide both sides by 20, I'm going to get a positive answer. That one I think I can do in my head because I think it's going to be 11.1. .1. Although, given my mistake on the arrows, I should check and make sure if there's a second on that. Okay. You got me. Okay, you got it. All right. So BY is 11.1 .1 kip. So this is And so if BY is 11.1 .1 kips going up, then AY is 11.1 .1 kips going down. Okay. And so we'll formalize that over here. Okay. All right. Everybody good? All right. Now, in order to analyze this structure, um, all we've done so far is, is determine the external forces required to keep the structure in equilibrium. We've got that whole internal set of stuff going on as well. Um, now, remember, we have the method of joints or the method of sections. Um, the method of sections is fine if we want to spot check, but... Usually, you know, I like to apply the method of joints because I'll get the forces everywhere. And this is a really small truss, so you might as well just apply the method of joints. Um, can we go ahead and analyze joint D right now? See if anybody remembers why there's an issue with starting at joint D. Too many there's too many unknowns, right? Remember, the method of joints um, will only allow you to solve a joint that has at most Two unknowns. And we have one, two, three members going through joint D. So that's a problem. Um, but we could go ahead and start at joint B, couldn't we? Let's look at joint B. Okay, so I'm going to, here's what I'm going to do. Let's look at joint B. So, so if we look at joint B, joint B has, you know, here's the joint. And we have a single member like that. Joint B has an applied load of 11.1 .1 kips, and then we have a single force inside that member. What is the force inside that member? It's 11.1 .1 kips down. So, so therefore, the force in member BD is 11.1 .1 kips in what? It's a compression because we're pushing on that joint. So this member is experiencing compression, okay? So what I would say is this is not the type of member that we've been talking about for the past couple weeks. This is a compression member. We're looking at tension members. So I hope that that diagonal force is experiencing tension. Otherwise, this would be a real short problem. So now we can go ahead and, um, we can go ahead and look at joint... Um, Joint D, I guess. Let's go ahead and look at that. So let's look at joint D. So my apologies for the scrolling, um, but let's make sure that we characterize joint D correctly. So joint D, we have one, two, three members framing into it. We have a diagonal at a three to four slope ratio. Okay. So...
a diagonal at a three to four slope ratio. Okay, and let's, all, let's not also forget a 14.8 kip load applied here. And let's also not forget that we know that that is 11.1 .1 kips, right? So that's going up, right? Up or down? It's going up, right? Because if it's in compression, it's in compression across the board. Remember, equal and opposite, okay? All right, now let's write out our unknowns. We have an unknown here, an unknown here, and an unknown here. So we have two unknowns in the horizontal, one unknown in the vertical, right? Because that's a diagonal member. It's got X and Y components. So tell me what to do. There we go. So if I sum forces in the y direction, I get that member, what did I call that, AD? So AD, Y is 11.1 .1 kips going down. So if I solve for that, then what do I do? Slope ratio. So the slope ratio says that these two are related. And basically what it says is that ADX is to something as AD Y is to something. ADX is to what? What goes here? Four, right? The four here, and that one's three. So four. So therefore, ADX is four thirds of ADY, which is? 14.8. Which way does that go? To the left or to the right? To the left. To the left. So we are in tension. So that's good. By the way, what is going on in this member right here? What's that? You're looking at what is that? It's a zero force member. Okay. This is a zero force member. In fact, if you go back to the very beginning of the problem, what are the rules for identifying zero force members? Look at this joint. There's no load applied at the joint. There's only two members. That and that are zero force members. So, so therefore, how do we find the force in member AD? How do we do that? If I have ADX and ADY, what do I do? Break out the old Pythagorean theorem. And what is member AD? What's it experiencing? 18.5 kips. Do I have a second on that? Yeah. In what? Tension or compression? There we go. So now, the threaded rod stuff, that's easy. So let's design this threaded rod. So designing this threaded rod, so what's, so in order to design a threaded rod, what we're going to do is we're going to plug everything in to the following expression. It's just 8 thirds times the square root of PU over FU pi. And if you're like, well, Dr. Mike, where did you come up with that? That just seems to come out of nowhere. Well, all that is, is just taking this expression right here, setting it equal to our factored load, and say, okay, what do we need to do? We're solved for dB. We'll flip this fraction here, flip this fraction over here, put 
the load there, and that equals bb squared. Take the square root of the whole thing. And so what are we left with over here? 64 over 9, that's 8 thirds, the square root of that. PU's on top, FU pi's on the bottom. That's basically it. So that's where that came from. So it's, it's really not all that, all that challenging. So what is our PU going to be? What's the load that we're designing for? 18.5. That, that's the load in the rod. Okay. So the only thing left we actually haven't talked about is what is FU? 58. How'd you get that? But why? Like why 58? Four, eight. No, what I'm saying is it's 836 steel. That's what I'm saying. So therefore, DB min is eight thirds. Then we have. What do we get for DB min? Say it again. 0 0.85. So it actually, it's like it goes like 0 0.8497 or 0 0.850, you know, how, however you want to do that. But um, so I'm going to call Huntington Steel up and I'm going to say, give me a 0 0.8497 inch diameter bar, right? No, I'm not. What am I going to ask him for? to the nearest eighth, and what is that going to be? So what's three quarters? What's three over four? <clears throat> 0. 0.75, right? What about, so that's six eighths, what about seven eighths? Seven eighths is fine. 0. 0.875, so I'm going to say use the seven eighths inch diameter rod. That's, that's what I'm going to use. I remember from CAD, if you ever see that sign on plans, that just means diameter. But yeah, that's it. So, um, so yeah, so this, this problem probably like exercised your 312 skills a little more probably than you expected this morning. Um, but what I'll say is the homework I'm about to give you is much easier on the 312 stuff. No... Uh, actually not really much in the way of like reactions or truss analysis or any of that stuff. So um, does anybody have any questions? All right, I do want to show you the homework and talk a little bit about it and then I'm going to let you go. So so first off, you can probably guess the theme of the homework, right? So uh, this homework is themed after the Hyatt Regency uh, 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 situation. So we're going to design 836 threaded rods for this suspended walkway. Okay. Now a couple things about the um, the walkway. Okay. So um, the walkway is six foot wide. Okay. And the threaded rods are spaced 20 feet apart along the walkway. Okay. So I want you to assume the walkway goes on forever, okay? And so the rods are spaced every 20 feet, okay? Now we've got dead load and live load, okay? The dead load is the slab, okay? So how, how do we deal with the slab? Well, we know the slab is four and a half inches thick, okay? And we know the slab is made out of reinforced concrete, okay? So we're going to assume the concrete weighs 150 pounds per cubic foot, okay? Um, the walkway is also going to be subjected to a 100 pound per square foot live load. So the 100 pounds per square foot is going to simulate the people on the walkway. Okay, and that's a pretty heavy load uh, for people. All right, uh, that's pretty dense. Okay, and so what we need to do is we need to determine the amount of load on each um, 
uh, on each rod, okay? So I'm going to give you a couple hints, and then I'm going I'm to let you go. But um, I'll see if I can reason with you on a couple things, all right? So, all right. So a couple things, all right? So the walkway, as I said, goes on forever, okay? So let's say that, you know, this is the plan view for the walkway. So plan view, remember that's in the helicopter looking down. So if you're in the helicopter looking down, what are you going to see? You're going to see a walkway going on like this. It's going to go on forever. This dimension here is going to be what? Six foot wide. Okay. And then you're also going to see rods sticking up at you. Like this. And how far apart are those rods spaced? 20 feet. 20 feet. So I guess my question for you What's the tributary area for this rod, okay? How do you determine the tributary area for a rod, right? Remember the whole halfway over, halfway over? Remember that? Okay. So that's something to think about. The other thing to think about is the following, okay? So... So for the dead load, okay, we need to determine like how much dead load goes on a given rod. Well, I propose what we can do is we can take, let's just do it like this, unit weight times volume, okay? In other words, the, um, the, the unit weight of concrete Okay, which you were given in the problem, 150 pounds per cubic foot. So we can say the unit weight of the concrete times the volume. And how do we calculate the volume? The volume would be the tributary area times the thickness of the slab, right? And the only other thing I'll say Pay attention to units right there. Okay. So for dead load, here, here's what I'll say about dead load. So dead load is the unit weight times the volume. For the live load, I gave you a pressure load to be applied over the tributary area. Follow the units, you'll see how, how that, one's, that one's actually easier. Okay. Sound good? All right. I think I've given you enough hints to be able to reason through that one. Um, and that's all I have. I'm going to end this class 10 minutes early, one, but with one final note. Um, what do we have on Wednesday? Review. Review. So come prepared with questions for the exam. That's all I got. I will see you all on Wednesday.